just being introduced up in Chapman Hall. We'll bring this to you live and a reminder that uh, this whole program, everything you've seen today will re-air tonight at midnight Eastern time and we'll be back again live tomorrow. Mike Foundation, OHL Oriano, American Airlines and many other generous sponsors. We'd also like to acknowledge the friends of the book fair and we see many of them here today. Please join me in thanking them for their generosity. Towards the end of the session, we will have a Q&A opportunity with a microphone in the center of the aisle. Um, the authors will also be autographing books in the area near where you lined up prior to entering towards the right of the elevator. At this time, I invite you to please silence your cell phones and of course, enjoy the program. I'd like to introduce Dr. Eldridge Birmingham, who's the Chief Science Officer of the Frost My Museum of Science. He will introduce our authors. It's great to be here. I even get a book and autographs. So I'm feeling very lucky. A very young looking Richard Dawkins here. So as you were told, I'm Eldridge or Biff Birmingham. I'm the chief science officer of this magnificent museum that's being built around the corner on that dynamic edge between the Everglades and the Gulf Stream and sitting between the temperate zone and the tropic zone. We in invite you all to come. It'll open in about a year, but that's not the point tonight. I'm here to, in to introduce Richard Dawkins, and first I have to tell you just a very quick tale. I was a student at Cornell University in the 70s when Selfish Gene came out, and I was on my way and actually started in veterinary college at Cornell University, and I became so enthralled with the book and with the conversation that ensued at Cornell around the book that I changed my own career direction and went into genetics, so I owe a lot to, to Richard Dawkins. So Richard Dawkins, has been voted Prospect Magazine's number one world thinker, quite an honor, has previously published 11 books, all still in print, including The Selfish Gene, the blockbuster bestseller, The God Delusion, and obviously his magnum opus, The Ancestor's Tale. This is actually really remarkable when you think about it. Richard's a fellow of both the Royal Society and the Royal Society of Literature. He was the inaugural holder of the Simon, uh, Simon E. Chair for the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University and is the recipient of numerous honorary degrees and awards, including the International Cosmos Prize of Japan, which I actually think is more incredible than the Nobel Prize, for those of you who know about the Cosmos Prize. In An Appetite for Wonder, The Making of a Scientist, Richard Dawkins shares a rare view into his early life, his intellectual awakening at Oxford, and his path to writing the selfish gene. Here for the first time is an intimate memoir of the childhood and intellectual development of the evolutionary biologist and world famous atheist, and the story of how he came to write what is widely held to be one of the most important books of the 20th century. Dr. Professor Dawkins is also gonna be joined on stage by Jeffrey Allen Lieberman, uh, who holds the, I've got to look at this, the Lieber Chair and directs the Lieber Center for Schizophrenia Research in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia and serves as psychiatrist in chief of New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center. I'll leave it to all of you and to Dr. Lieberman to explain why we have somebody who studies schizophrenia interviewing Professor Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eldridge. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Lieberman, in case you didn't recognize or couldn't distinguish who was who. And this is Professor Richard Dawkins. Eldridge, thank you for that. I will answer why a psychiatrist who studies schizophrenia is interviewing uh, a scholar who has uh, uh, focused, in terms of one of his works, on the uh, evolutionary significance of genes. Um, but basically, it's all genetics, as uh, Professor Dawkins has, has told us. Um, before we begin, I just want to say uh, how pleased I am to be here and to offer my gratitude to Mitchell Kaplan, who's been the inspiration and co-founder of the Miami Book Fair, and also to uh, uh, Professor uh, Padron, who is the president of Miami-Dade College, for hosting this event. It's truly a magnificent event and something for uh, the city of Miami to be proud of. 
Um, Eldridge introduced Professor Dawkins, which I could add to but won't in the interest of saving time. We're going to talk for roughly a half an hour and then open the floor for uh, a few minutes of questions. So ready yourself if you're uh, inclined to ask a question. Um, the uh, reason we're here tonight is because Professor Dawkins, in addition to his academic and scientific research, has been inclined to speak to the public and educate the public about scientific issues, but also about non-scientific issues from the perspective of a, of a scientist. And that's something that's not easy to do and not many of his scientific colleagues are inclined to do. Alan Alda, a famous actor who's a good friend of mine, um, is an admiration uh, of scientists who do this and said not enough do it or are able to do it. So I want to first thank Professor Dawkins for his prodigious output and really putting himself into the sort of battlefield of the public arena uh, by trying to speak and communicate scientific complex issues to the public or even non-scientific ways uh, issues in a way that uh, uh, involves sort of rigorous scientific analysis. Now, Professor Dawkins has written 12 books now. Uh, the reason we're here tonight is because of this one. Uh, his memoir, which is An Appetite for Wonder, The Making of a Scientist. And um, this is a departure from what he's done before in his prior 11 books, beginning with The Selfish Gene. Um, and uh, I guess I would sort of start by asking, um, <clears throat> this is a memoir. Uh, in reading it, I was, I wouldn't say surprised, but... Um, sort of uh, seem pleasantly sort of uh, um, to find that this is truly a memoir of actually what your life was like from at least your ancestry and birth up until publication of The Selfish Gene and immediately thereafter. And I noticed that one of the uh, endorsements that you had in the book was from The Guardian where they said, a quote, a surprisingly intimate and moving book. So why now? Why after having written scientifically for, your, uh, for the academia and for the public in the way that you have, why was it time to write a memoir? I suppose it's time to write a memoir because I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and uh, I, more to the point actually, my mother is still alive at the age of 98 and uh, so she, um, she has an excellent memory, and so I was able to tap her memory for uh, my childhood, and indeed the book includes a few extracts from her diaries. Um, so uh, why does anyone write a memoir? I mean, it's a, it's a sort of rather presumptuous thing to suppose that anybody would want to read. I mean, who on earth wants to read a memoir about me, if you see what I mean? In fact, one of the more hostile reviews that I got in an English paper says something like, the trouble with this autobiography is it seems to be all about the author. <laughs> um, so, yes, I don't know really why, why now. I I'd, I'd vaguely had it in mind that it might be a good idea, but I suppose the honest answer is that the publishers wanted it. And, and, and we're certainly glad they invited you to do this. Um, so, um, I confess to having certainly been familiar with you and your work particularly uh, from uh, having read the, the Selfish Gene. Um, but in reading this book, uh, I became aware of, of what truly is an amazing life you've had. I mean, you have had an extraordinary range of experiences and family and colleagues to, to sort of uh, uh, contribute and to interact with over the course of your life. Your ancestry, which is depicted in the pedigree uh, in the initial pages of the book, is quite fascinating. Um, your ethnic racial origins are from England, but you were born in Kenya. You then uh, moved to South Africa. Uh, you then returned to England, where you, for the most part, remained, except for a, a stint in Berkeley. Um, and you had educational experiences beginning in Rhodesia at Eagle, 
and then uh, Chafe and Grove in England, and then uh, Oundle, and then another public school in England, and then on to Oxford and Balliol College, UC Berkeley, and back to Oxford. Um, it seems that it really was an amazing life, which in some way had to have contributed to you know, who you became and what you've been able to, to do. Um, was it really that good, or did you leave anything out? Well, it's very nice to have an interviewer who's obviously read the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it, I, I wouldn't say that, that actually my childhood uh, foreshadowed very much my becoming a scientist. I sort of feel I was a bit of a late developer, and it really wasn't until I got to Oxford as an undergraduate that I really became obsessed with science. And even then, it wasn't the natural history aspects of science that intrigued me, but rather the philosophical ones. I was intrigued by the deep questions of existence. What, why is there life at all? What's it all about? What's it for? And uh, I early decided that biology, evolution especially, was the, the, the right way to answer that kind of question. Um, so um, I don't know whether my life's that fascinating. Doesn't everybody have an interesting life? I, I, um, I suppose I was born in Africa, uh, which not everybody was, though our, our species was, by the way. And so, um, so in a way, I, was, I, I went back to not just my roots, but everybody's roots. My foundation, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, has a T-shirt which says, we are all Africans. And it means that uh, all humans, we're all a, a brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, we're all close relatives, uh, and we all hail from the dark continent of Africa. Well, you, you moved, uh, your family moved to England when you were eight, uh, but prior to that, you were in South Africa, and you went to the Eagle School in, in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Um, even at that young age, did you have some particular sort of experience or recollections given the political circumstances in apartheid? No, not really. It, it was actually uh, Nyasaland, which was a British colony, which is just a little bit north of South Africa. So, um, uh, no, uh, but although there was no apartheid, there was the typical British imperial uh, racism in the sense of a kind of patronizing condescension to the Africans. Uh, we lived a life of sort of Edwardian, almost Victorian um, uh, gentry with servants. Uh, and they, the, the men were called boys. Uh, so it was a, a patronizing, they were kind of, I, I, I wouldn't say that they were treated badly, but they were treated with condescension as though they were children. Uh, which is, a, in a way, a more, insi a more insidious kind of racism, I suppose you, you could say. And I'm sure this was true of the whole British Empire, probably the French Empire as, and the Dutch Empire and things as, as, as well. And, and that really didn't, didn't change until, well, I, probably the 1950s. But your, your first seminal publication for the public, The Selfish Gene, uh, introduced a... Uh, new sort of thesis to extend uh, our understanding of the mechanism of evolution, and that is uh, through genetics. In, 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 in this, uh, genes are the currency of evolution and, and play a role as the medium or the, the mechanistic medium by which selective pressures, natural selection, is brought to bear on, on, on evolution. Um, so, in some ways, which you wrote this in 1976, yes. mm -hmm. it was really prescient because as a physician who studies uh, human disease um, in the wake of the sequencing of the genome, which occurred in 2003, uh, our whole understanding of the role of genetics, the way, diverse way in which the genes and uh, DNA and chromosomes can express themselves has totally transformed our opinion about how we understand illness, uh, how we understand sort of human biology and life. Um, and you had anticipated this in the context of your evolutionary biological career, uh, which is quite extraordinary. Um, I'm not sure if that's yet been fully appreciated, how yeah. you had sort of uh, foreseen this. But 
in order to become a little more entertaining for the uh, audience, let me, let me try and come back to the autobiographical stuff and get a little personal. Um, you, your father was a botanist. Your mother was a naturalist. Had some orientation. You've been married three times. Yes. You're currently married. You have one daughter. Yes. The thesis of the selfish gene is that um, <clears throat> the way evolution works is that genes are um, inclined to perpetuate themselves through procreation. Yes. I, I think the point here is that we, we, we see animals and plants as bodies, as great big things which, which walk around and do things and grow and, and so on. Um, but what's really going on is information digital information, it's just like computer information, which in our kind of life is DNA. And it's only DNA that actually survives. When you talk about the survival of the fittest, when you talk about the struggle for existence, uh, bodies do struggle for existence, but they don't struggle for perpetual existence. They struggle only to reproduce. They struggle to survive and they struggle to reproduce. And that means they struggle to pass on the digital information that built them in the first place. The genes that are now inside us potentially can go on for millions of years in the form of exact copies of themselves with occasional inexactitude, which is, which is mutation. And because genes are potentially immortal, because they're in the information form, they're potentially immortal, that means that the ones that are successful in surviving uh, go on forever, or for a very, very long, long time, as for, forever compared to ordinary generation time. Successful genes go on fut through future generations, unsuccessful ones don't. Bodies are just the temporary throwaway survival machines for the genes that built them and that ride inside them. And because they ride inside them, the death of the body is the death of the gene. The failure of the body to reproduce is the failure of the genes to get through into the next generation. So what we see as we look around the world is bodies that were made by successful genes, and by successful I mean very strictly successful at making ancestors. Another way to look at it is that every living creature is descended from an unbroken line of successful ancestors, every single one of your ancestors succeeded in achieving at least one heterosexual copulation. <laughs> and that's not true of the great majority of animals that have ever lived. Most, most animals that have ever lived have either died young or failed to get a mate. So we are all descended from an elite of organisms that have, back to the beginning of life, an, an elite lineage that has succeeded in every single generation in surviving long enough to reproduce and then, and then reproducing. So we all of us, whether we're humans or bats or, or wombats or, or, or hippopotamuses or, or pine trees, we, we, we all of us carry the genes that make us good at what we do, and what we do in the case of bats is flying, in the case of dolphins is swimming, in the case of moles is digging, in the case of gibbons is swinging by, by their arms through the treetops, uh, and in the case of humans is thinking. So all different species do it a different way, but fundamentally they're all doing exactly the same thing, which is working to preserve the genetic instructions that made them in the first place, and that ride inside them as uh, the, the, the vehicle that, that, that they ride inside. And their fate is bound up in the fate of the vehicle that, that they built. And so they'd better be good at building vehicles, better be good at building bodies, or they wouldn't be here. And they are here, or we wouldn't see them. So all the animals that we see are good at doing what they do, uh, or potentially good at doing what, what they do, because they are descended from an unbroken line of successful ancestors and inherit the genes that made them successful. So um, genes are the replicators and uh, bodies, whether they be animals or humans or plants, are the vehicles. Um, 
why didn't you have more children? <laughs> well, um, I am not a, a believer in the idea that because natural selection, genetic um, se selection, is what gives us existence, that that should dictate what we ought to do. It's perfectly true that we are programmed, like all animals and all plants, to spend all our time and all our energy in struggling to reproduce. But the great glory of the human species is that we have, uh, through the process of evolution by natural selection, acquired brains that are big enough to emancipate themselves from the uh, struggles that gave rise to them in the first place. Steven Pinker, the great um, linguist and psychologist, put it well when he said, I do not intend to reproduce, and if my selfish genes don't like it, they can go jump in the lake. <laughs> uh, um, it, this is actually quite a serious point. Um, two, two points I'd make. One is a kind of political point, that if we really did all govern our lives uh, by a selfish gene point of view, if we, re if we really did, uh, in our daily lives, fulfill the aims of our selfish genes, we would be living in a very, very unpleasant society. We'd be living in a dog-eat-dog -dog society, um, a sort of Thatcherite, Reaganite, um, <laughs> carry to an extreme. Um, we would be uh, indulging in rape and pillage and, and, and the sort of things that Vikings were, were re historically reputed to, to do, or Genghis Khan. Um, and and we've, we've got beyond that. It's, in one respect, we haven't got beyond it, because one of the things that was built into our gene, into our, into our brains, by genetic selection, was a tendency for brains to set up goals and purposes which originally would have had the purpose uh, or, or goal of propagating genes. So originally, we ha were equipped in our brains with the tendency to set up purposes like find food, find a cave to live in, find a water hole, uh, take care to avoid being eaten by a lion, all aimed towards the ultimate goal of reproduction. But because we were given in our brains the software to set up goals and sub-goals and sub-sub-goals, we can use those, that software, that goal-seeking software, to set up other goals that actually have nothing to do with reproduction. We can set up a goal to write a book and satisfy the publishers. <laughs> yeah. We can set up a, a goal to win a, a football game. We can set up a goal to, uh, um, well, all the different things that we do. We most of the time are setting up short-term goals that we want to achieve, little knowing that the goal-seeking software that we're using was originally put there by natural selection for the ultimate goal of reproducing, of having lots of, 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 of children. But we've cut the ground from under the feet of that, and we now set up these other goals, which our ancestors always did anyway, but in that case, their sub-goals were uh, directed towards the ultimate goal of reproduction. Nowadays, they're, set up, they're, they're directed towards other goals, like, as I say, um, reading a book, or, or finishing writing a book. Um, the goal of reproduction, in any case, is uh, well served by the more proximate goal of uh, having sex, which we still do, whether we want our selfish genes to go jump in the lake or not. Um, and in our primitive ancestors, it would have been enough to have a strong sex drive. Uh, that would have, I mean, children would tend to sort of follow automatically in a world without contraception. Uh, but nowadays, in a world with contraception, we can all enjoy ourselves and uh, tell our genes to go and jump in the lake. Now, uh, one of and perhaps the most sort of innovative and, and also controversial uh, aspect of your, your genetic thesis is um, the th concept of the extended phenotype. And uh, just reading from 
the selfish gene, uh, the definition of the extended phenotype is an animal's behavior or, or their appearance, because it's not limited to how they behave, it's also how they look and their size and so forth, uh, tends to maximize the survival of the genes for that behavior or uh, physical characteristic, whether or not those genes happen to be in the body of the particular organism performing it. Well, that may be a little complicated. Yes, okay. Um, when I said that the fate of the genes is bound up in the vehicle that they ride about in, that is true most of the time. But my second book, The Extended Phenotype, which was written mainly for a professional audience, generalizes the principle and points out that actually the phenotype, the, the phenotype is the external manifestation of genetic um, tendencies. And mostly phenotypes are parts of the body in which the genes ride. So uh, the, the legs of a beaver, the tail of a beaver, the eyes of a beaver, the whiskers of a beaver, the fur of a beaver, these are all phenotypic manifestations of genes inside the beaver genes riding around inside the vehicle that is the beaver, and their survival is served by the effects that they have on the hair, the tail, the legs, the eyes, the muzzle, etc., of the beaver. But of course, beavers also do other things, well-known things, like they build dams and lodges. And the dam of a beaver is, this was really my contribution, the dam of a beaver is part of its phenotype because in exactly the same way as genes survive because of their effects on the body of the vehicle in which they ride, in special cases like beaver dams, genes survive by virtue of their effects on the dam, which is not part of the beaver's body and is not something that they ride inside, but nevertheless is phenotypic effect in the same way as the tail of the beaver or the whiskers of the beaver is phenotypic effect. So any animal artifact, a bird's nest, a spider's web, a beaver dam, a termite mound, these all can be regarded as extended phenotypes. So that was the first step in the argument of the extended phenotype. And then I generalized it to say, well, in the same way as the beaver dam or the um, the, the caddis house, you know, caddis larvae are, um, cad caddis flies are fairly nondescript, sort of brown insects that fly about, but their larvae build for themselves little houses out of stones or out of sticks or out of little tiny snail shells, and they cement them together and they make a beautiful little house in which the larva lives. So it's like a, a snail shell, but it's built by the behavioral efforts of the larva. It's a most remarkable process to watch, the, the building of a caddis larva house. Now, the, the house in which the caddis lives is an extended phenotype. Now compare that to a snail. A snail has a shell which is uh, secreted by the body of the snail and is part of the normal phenotype of the snail. Now consider a parasite, a fluke, say, living inside the snail. And the, the, the fluke gains protection from the snail shell, just as the snail gains protection from the snail shell, and just as the caddis larva gains protection from the stone house. But the fluke, at least in some cases, has an influence on the snail shell. Snails that have a fluke inside them, at least in one case that I studied, snails that have a fluke inside them have thicker shells than snails without a fluke. It looks as though the fluke is, this kind of worm, it looks as though the fluke is uh, improving the snail shell for its own good. Why would it do that? Why, why if, the, if the snail shell could be improved, why doesn't the snail do it anyway? See what I'm building towards, that the snail shell, or the extra thickening of the snail shell, is part of the extended phenotype of genes in the fluke. Natural selection comes along and favors genes in the fluke that have phenotypic snail 
shell. Why doesn't the snail do it anyway? Because there's a compromise between the needs of survival and reproduction. A snail that had a shell that was too thick would be less likely to reproduce because it puts too much work, too much energy into thickening its shell and doesn't have enough left over for reproduction. So the optimum shell thickness for the fluke, for the parasite inside the snail, is thicker than for the snail itself, which is why I'm saying that the, the thicker shell is an extended phenotype of the fluke. Generalizing that again, any time that a parasite has an effect on its host, which many of them do, sometimes quite remarkable effects, uh, we can call that an extended phenotype. There's another kind of worm called a brain worm, which infects ants. And an infected ant is, has its behavior changed. The brain worm actually burrows into the brain of the ant and makes a lesion in the brain of the ant, just like a physiologist might make a lesion in the brain of the ant, and causes the ant to, instead of going down into the ground in the heat of the day, the ant goes up stems, grass stems, to the top where it shouldn't be in the middle of the day. And there it becomes vulnerable to being eaten by a sheep, which is exactly what the brain worm wants. Because the brain worm's next host after the, after the, the, the ant um, is a sheep. And there are lots and lots of examples of parasites manipulating their hosts for their own advantage. And now I want to uh, regard every one of those changes in the host's behavior as an extended phenotype. Finally, uh, the, a parasite doesn't actually have to live inside its host. Cuckoos and cowbirds, which are sort of American equivalent of, of, of cuckoos, parasitize other birds by laying eggs in the other bird's nest and then the cuckoo hatches out. And uh, I'll talk about cuckoos, not, not cowbirds, European cuckoos. Um, and all kinds of adaptations of the, of the, of the nestling cuckoo um, influence the host, cause the host, to, the host bird to, to rear it, to feed it. You see grotesque pictures of gigantic baby cuckoos dwarfing their foster parent. And the foster parent is frantically working to, to stuff food into the gaping maw of the of the, of the cuckoo. The cuckoo somehow manages to exert an influence on the behavior of the host. That, again, is an extended phenotype, even though the cuckoo doesn't live inside its host. And then you can generalize that to any influence that animals have on each other. Uh, the nightingale song, proverbially intoxicating. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of Hemlock I had drunk. One minute passed, and Lethe Woods had sunk. Keats was not a bird. He was a, he was a mammal. But the effect that, the drugging effect, as though of Hemlock I had drunk, the drugging effect on John Keats is, I'm conjecturing, the same as the male nightingale is uh, having on a female nightingale. So the uh, the female nightingale is being drugged by the, by the male nightingale song, manipulated. It's as though a brain physiologist had come along uh, and injected a drug into the, into the female. The male can't do that. He doesn't have a hypodermic. But he does have a, have a voice. And the voice has been honed over generations to become an extremely powerful, intoxicating influence, so intoxicating that it, it even intoxicated John Keats, who's, who, at, at whom it was not aimed, since he's not a female nightingale. Um, okay, that's enough on the extended phenotype. Sorry, it went on a bit long. <laughs> Now, uh, uh, as you know better than any of us, there have been a number of sort of questions and challenges and criticisms of um, the kind of evolutionary biological 
thesis of the role of genetic mechanisms, including the extended phenotype, just to sort of ask you to try and comment, refute uh, a couple of the most obvious. Um, one is altruism. How do you explain altruism? And you uh, invoke or you describe your uh, belief in the Hamilton rule, Bill Hamilton or William Hamilton, a colleague of yours, a friend, and I'll allow you to explain that to the audience. And then does that apply to one of your Oxford mentors, Mike Cullen, who had such a uh, significant influence in your career? Yes, the, the book, The Selfish Gene, could just as well have been called The Altruistic Gene, uh, because it, much of the book is actually about altruism. Um, it's widely misunderstood as being an, a, a book about selfishness or even an advocacy of selfishness. Um, it's uh, thought to be that by people who've read the book by title only. Uh, reading the title and omitting the rather large footnote, which is the book itself. Um, it's, um, a, a lot of it is about altruism, and it discusses two main ways in which altruistic organisms are favored by selfish genes. Selfish genes, uh, because they are the immortals, because they're the ones that go through the generations, they uh, achieve this feat of going through the generations partly by programming their bodies, their vehicles, into being very good at surviving at the expense of others. That would be being selfish. Partly by programming them to reproduce, obviously. You can't get into the next generation if you're a gene, if you don't cause your vehicle to reproduce. But also, there is another way to do it with, with collateral kin. Uh, you can calculate, and, and um, it's been done several times, you can calculate the probability that a gene in you will be in any relative you like, like a nephew, a niece, a sister, a great-nephew, a grandchild. And the, 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 the probability is a, is a known function. It's easy to, easy to calculate. So if you imagine a gene for making an individual be altruistic towards, say, nieces, that gene has a 25% chance of ending up in the body of the niece helped. So therefore, if the cost of the altruist, if the cost to the altruist is not very great and the benefit to the niece, to the beneficiary, is great, and in this case, since it's a 25%, it has to be four times as great, then that gene will survive. There will be a tendency for that gene to survive. Bill Hamilton, whom you've just mentioned, my colleague and um, friend, uh, was the one who worked out this theory, worked it out um, very thoroughly in, in 1964. He himself was a great expert in social insects, and uh, which of course are the supreme altruists who look after kin other than their own offspring. Most of the work in an ant colony or a termite colony or a, bees, a beehive uh, is done by uh, workers who are sterile, who have no prospect of reproducing themselves but instead put all their efforts into the reproduction of the queen or males uh, and, in the, and the rearing of young queens and young males who may be their younger siblings or their nephews and nieces. So the social insects are the, uh, the sort of showcase of this theory of kin selection. Uh, and although they're the showcase, the theory applies to all animals, even if they don't actually show altruism towards collateral kin, towards nephews and nieces or brothers and sisters. The, the reason they don't show it is that the economics of the situation don't favor it. Uh, you, you'll only get an actual evolution of sibling altruism or niece altruism if the economic circumstances favor it, taking into account this probability factor of the, of the probability of sharing a gene. It happens that the ecological, economic circumstances of ants, bees, wasps, and termites are such as to favor extreme kin altruism. And there are quite a number of other animals which are a little bit less extreme. Quite a lot of birds like acorn woodpeckers in California, quite a lot of uh, mammals, the most extreme being the naked mole rat of East Africa. 
uh, which are kind of vertebrate equivalents of, of social insects. So it's a powerful theory uh, and, uh, a, and, an, and a correct one. So Eldridge, here's where the schizophrenia comes in. So then how do you um, understand uh, conditions, uh, diseases such as autism or schizophrenia which, in which the reproductive capacity of individu individuals is, is significantly impaired but their population frequency remains stable or even increases if you believe the CDC figures of rates of autism yes. in the United States? Um, the, 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 the question of why we have any genetic diseases at all, of course, is easily answered by, by mutation. That, 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 that there's, a, there's a certain rare uh, occurrence of mutations which are disadvantageous and things like um, hemophilia, Huntington's chorea, these, these uh, terrible afflictions which are, which are genetic. Um, they're explained by, by mutation. Mutation happens. Mutation uh, has to happen, or evolution, natural selection would have nothing to, to work on. They're accidental, they're just mis mistakes, and we notice the ones that are bad, as, as many of them are. But when you talk about uh, things like schizophrenia, which occur, and, which occur at a higher frequency than you'd expect by mutation, that's a real puzzle. And uh, it, one is kind of tempted to think along the lines of, um, could there be some sort of advantage in, um, I mean, it probably, it's hard to imagine it for schizophrenia, but one could imagine in some cases um, that perhaps autism, um, that uh, autistic individuals might have advantages under some circumstances. It doesn't sound all that plausible, but, but it, it's, it has been suggested that perhaps they're the extreme of a spectrum and maybe uh, milder forms along the spectrum have an advantage. But this is your field more than mine, so I oughtn't to be, to be really pontificating about it. Well, maybe if I write a book someday, you'll interview me about this. <laughs> um, so I, I can't uh, uh, you know, conclude the interview without asking you at least one question about um, the God delusion, uh, which was one of your books, somewhat of a departure. Um, so how is your, th and I, I gather you were uh, acquainted, if not friends, with Christopher Hitchens? and you spoke at his funeral. Um, so how does your uh, view of religion in this context sort of compare to those of Hitchens or Sam Harris uh, uh, in this country who's written about this? Well, but they're pretty similar. I mean, Christopher Hitchens' book is, is God is Not Great. Um, Sam Harris wrote The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation. Those are the two books which um, uh, which are about, about, about atheism for him. Um, I would say that my approach to atheism is a sort of more scientific one. I'm interested in the academic question of whether there is a supreme intelligence, creative intelligence behind the universe, which I regard as a scientific question. It would be a very interesting scientific hypothesis that there is a creative intelligence behind the universe. A universe with a creative intelligence would be a very different kind of universe from one without. So I think it's a scientific question, uh, and that for me is primary, but the, the book also includes moral and, and value considerations as well. I think for Christopher, uh, it's, it's rather that the values and the, mo and the morality and the politics come first. Uh, he regarded God, I mean, I suppose especially the Judeo-Christian Muslim God as a, as a, as a tyrant, as a, as a dictator, uh, a, a sort of, in a sort of celestial North Korea. Uh, and he, he, he said um, the difference is that in, in, in North Korea uh, you can at least escape by dying. <laughs> well, okay. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, I, I wanted to um, sort of uh, share an anecdote related to religion, as a matter of fact, um, an anecdote um, that relates to the issue of um, how your book has impacted uh, individuals, people, our society. And uh, I'm not sure to what degree you've sort of uh, informed yourself about that or what your thoughts are, but. Um, 
just by coincidence, uh, on the way down here today, I was uh, um, talking with a friend who's actually in the audience, Mark Jackman. It's a, a young man recently graduated from college who's a journalist now for one of the uh, television uh, networks. And um, he read The Selfish Gene when he was a freshman. And he was in a parochial school. And it said it completely transformed his thinking about this. And uh, all of a sudden, what might have been viewed as sort of like the um, delusion or the uh, fabrication that is sort of presented to people, either in kind of religion or in parochial school, you know, had a different, had a different view as if you know, the curtain had been pulled back and he had a much more enlightened sort of understanding of that. Um, and he related something I just can't help but mention was that his mother came in to tuck him in one night and said, uh, I love you. And she, he said, of course you do. I have your genes. <laughs> uh, so he, 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 didn't, he didn't go off the rails and uh, end up doing anything that was destructive. But uh, do you have, in the context of you know, how your book has impacted society, do you have any, uh, any distinct or vivid impressions? Well, uh, I, I must say it, it, it's true that a lot of people have said that it, it changed them. A lot of people have said they went into biology uh, because of it, which of course is immensely gratifying to me. Uh, I think it's probably true that... Um, and my, I hasten to say that the ideas in the selfish gene are all in the literature already. I, I express them, but they're, they come from Fisher, from Haldane, from... Hamilton, whom we just mentioned. Um, but I think it probably is as a result of the selfish gene that biologists, field biologists, doing muddy boots research in, 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 the, in uh, woods and fields and Serengeti in Africa and places, when they look at their animals, when they look at whatever their animals are, lions or seagulls or whatever they are, they, are not, they now see those animals as maximizing their own genetic survival. And I think that probably is a genuine change that's, that's come about. So um, although I was, in a sense, re-expressing orthodoxy, neo-Darwinian orthodoxy, dating really from the 1930s, uh, I, th I suppose I did put it in a sort of vivid rhetorical language which caused it to... Uh, catch fire in the, in the minds of field biologists in the way that previously had been rather sort of academic and they perhaps hadn't really taken it on board. I think that that's the most credit I, I, can, I can claim. So we're going to stop in a moment and invite questions for a few minutes. Uh, but before doing so, I just wanted to ask, um, Appetite for Wonder, uh, your current book, takes us through 1976. Um, which is the year of the publication of The Selfish Gene, which is roughly half of your yeah. life. Um, what, what comes next, and will you do a reprise? Okay, um, it, it, the, the autobiography uh, commissioned by the publishers was supposed to be my whole life. When I got halfway through, I sort of felt the need for a, for a sense of accomplishment. Um, <laughs> and... Um, so I asked the publishers whether they would mind if splitting it in half, and they were actually quite pleased about the idea. Uh, so I, and they suggested that the selfish gene would be a good break point, and indeed it was, and so I stopped it at the age of 35. And then the second volume is one that is, I've just about kind of finished it now. It's called Brief Candle in the Dark, which you'll instantly recognize as an allusion to Shakespeare followed by Carl Sagan. Um, out, out, brief candle, and then um, science as a candle in the dark. Um, and it takes me up to my, to my present age. Uh, it is uh, not chronological in the way that volume one is, that an appetite for wonder is. It's thematic. And uh, it, the, the themes are things like television, uh, lectures, books, uh, that, that's that kind of thing. Um, and it, it'll come out in 2015. Well, I'm glad that I asked that question. We have something to look forward to. So I want to uh, thank um, <clears throat> uh, Professor for this discussion. And we have a queue that's already forming. We'll take as many as the uh, stage manager will allow us. So, sir. <clears throat>
Okay, well, my question is this. Uh, one of your fellow atheists, Sam Harris, has just come out with a book where he's, you know, focused on, on marrying, you know, rationality with spirituality. I'm kind of uh, interested in, you know, uh, your atheistic perspective on that. And uh, any thoughts on the um, uh, Ben Affleck, Bill Maher, Islam controversy? It would be to malign Sam Harris to accuse him of uh, becoming religious. He is as staunch an atheist as anyone. Um, he is a great believer in meditation techniques as a, as a, more or less as a physiological uh, technique for um, leading a good life, meditation. And meditation techniques have been perfected by Buddhists. And so to that extent, Sam could be confused with a Buddhist. But uh, that should not take the form of supernatural beliefs in things like, uh, like reincarnation. There's nothing new about I mean, Sam has been interested in meditation, I think, for much of his, much of his life. Um, spiritual concerns, well, uh, I think uh, Carl Sagan, who's, who's I've just qu quoted, Science as a Candle in the Dark, also would have had a different kind of spiritual concern, as do I. Uh, we, one responds in a sort of poetic way, which could be called spiritual, to the, the wonders of the universe and of, and of life. The Ben Affleck, uh, whom I didn't know, but I understand he's Batman, um, <laughs> uh, was on Bill Maher's show with Sam Harris, and he vigorously and rather vitriolically attacked Sam accusing him of racism because Sam has criticized Islam. And that's a very easy thing to do, but it's a very silly, superficial thing to do because, of course, Islam is not a race. Uh, and it is an enormously widespread misconception that anybody who criticizes Islam is being religious. Um, I would say that if you can convert to it or apostatize out of it, then it's not a race. Okay. <laughs> so, it's nonsense to, to criticize uh, people like Sam Harris and indeed me, um, who, who, who go after the extremes that Islam can, can, can deliver uh, as, as, as racism. And um, I thought it was a rather disgraceful exhibition of bigotry on Ben Affleck's part and there's a kind of condescension about it actually as well because the horrific things that are done in the Islamic world, not of course by all Muslims, very far from it, but the horrific things that are done to gay people, to women, stoning women to death for the crime of being raped, throwing acid in their face for the crime of refusing to marry a cousin, refusing to let them drive cars, refusing to let them leave the house with, unless in the company of a male relative. These horrific things, misogynistic things, are, um, it's almost as though one's saying, uh, we, you, you, you brown people, we don't hold you to the same standards of uh, non-misogyny as we hold ourselves. Now, isn't that a patronizing and condescending thing to do, to use a different standard, to say, um, we, don't, um, we don't criticize you because, you're, because misogyny is part of your culture? And that, I think, is what uh, Ben Affleck was doing, among, among other things. It was, a, it was a disagreeable episode. I thought Sam handled it. Uh, very well. I think it was quite unexpected. I don't think that Ben Affleck had actually read anything that Sam had written. I think he probably had been briefed by somebody who said, Sam Harris is a racist Islamophobe, go after him. That, that would be what I suspect. Probably his publicist. Uh, yes. yes, sir. Yes, uh, pleasure to meet you again, Mr. Dawkins, Gibson Sylvester. Um, I just had a question for you. After having read uh, Darwin, and I've read um, almost everything you've ever written, uh, that's been published, one of the questions that's always seemed to seep through my mind 
is, you know, when we talk about the Big, big Bang Theory, we talk about evolution. One of the questions that I always have mulling around in my mind is when you think of the first unicellular organism, has the scientific community figured out where that first cell originated from? No, it hasn't, and uh, it's, one of the, it's one of the big uh, open questions. Uh, it's something that happened a very long time ago, but pro probably about four billion years ago, uh, not long after the Earth came into existence, about four, four and a half billion years ago. Um, we know the kind of thing it had to be. It had to be the origin of the first self-replicating information, the first gene, although it would certainly not have been DNA. Uh, DNA would have almost certainly come in later and usurped the role of the original replicator. So most of the theorizing, I would say perhaps all the theorizing that's going on now, is looking for the chemical event, some kind of a lucky random chemical event, which gave rise to a molecule which was self-replicating. As I say, it would not have been DNA. Uh, DNA can't do its job without protein, and protein can't do its job without DNA, so there's a catch-22 there. It could have been RNA, because RNA is capable both of doing the job of protein, which is being a catalyst, an enzyme, the sort of executive function in the cell, and, and RNA also can do what DNA does, namely the replication function, although not so well as DNA. So the current sort of vogue theory is that the original self-replicating molecule might have been RNA, and it did both jobs, both the enzyme job that was later taken over by protein and the replication job that was later taken over by DNA. And RNA remains as a very important mediator between them. And, and this, uh, 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 excuse me, we, we need to move on because there's so many people behind you. Okay. Thanks for the great Thank question. You so Thank you so much for your great answer. Yeah. Yes. Sir? Uh, yes, good evening. Um, I read The Selfish Gene quite a while ago, and I remember particularly the discussion of the evolution of altruism. And you touched on that tonight, talking about kin selection. But I believe the other mechanism was reciprocal altruism. And I wonder, is that still considered currently viable? And then what struck me at the time in thinking about how that might work is it might, as a byproduct of that, give a certain selection pressure to identify cheaters? And if you identify cheaters, do you also punish cheaters? So I wondered if that's a possible, con um, you know, does that yes, seem I mean, to make you're... sense? And has that been examined in the, in, in the biological world, punishment systems, uh, and this sort of thing? Yes, and, very much okay. so. Uh, um, the, the, uh, there are these really two prongs in explaining altruism. One, one is kin selection, as, as you said, and the other reciprocal altruism, which, where, where the individuals concerned don't have to be kin, they don't even have to be members of the same species, not even the same kingdom. Um, there's reciprocal altruism between, uh, between flowers and bees, uh, bees pollinating the flowers, flowers feeding the bees with aviation fuel, uh, which is nectar. Um, so uh, reciprocation, it, it works, because uh, the, in, in game theory terms, we have a non-zero-sum game. Um, both parties benefit from the other one's presence. Uh, it's, um, when, when it happens within a species, it, it often cons concerns doing good turns, feeding the other individual, for example, in the expectation of being fed later. A beautiful example of this is the work of Wilkinson on bats, vampire bats, which, as you know, uh, suck blood. And uh, Wilkinson worked out there's a kind of blood donor scheme uh, in, in these bats. Um, they, they feed at night and they, and they go and gnaw away at the, at the feet, at the, at the heels of things like cows and suck blood. And, and, anyone, and then they go back to their cave by, by day. Uh, at any one night, a bat may strike lucky, in which case it gets a surplus of blood, or it may strike unlucky and get no blood at all. And Wilkinson showed that if it gets no blood at all, it's in grave danger of dying. These bats need food every single day. Uh, whereas when they get a surplus, they've got more than they, than they need. So it's a perfect um, situation for reciprocal 
altruism. And they do indeed feed each other. A bat that has a surplus of blood will be solicited by a bat that struck unlucky that night and is starving. And the, the one with a surplus will give its surplus, will regurgitate uh, its surplus to the, to, the, to the starving one. So that's reciprocal altruism. Um, it's part of the theory that this should only work if the bats know each other so that they can identify potential cheaters, as you've said, and identify those individual bats who do good turns. And what Wilkinson did was to uh, set up artificial combinations of bats uh, in the lab, and some of his artificial co combinations of bats were from the same cave and therefore knew each other, and others of his artificial conglomerates of bats didn't know each other. And sure enough, it turned out that the ones that knew each other practiced reciprocal altruism, practiced the blood donor scheme. Uh, whereas the ones that did not know each other didn't, didn't do that. So it's a, it, that's just one particular example. But uh, the theory would be that it's a very, very common phenomenon. And things like guilt, cheating, a consciousness of debt, it may be very important in, hum in human evolution. Our, our very ability to do, to do arithmetic uh, may come from um, a tendency to, to reckon up debts that we, that we owe um, to potential um, to, 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 um, altru altruists. As you were answering, I was trying to think of how you would apply bat altruistic behavioral principles to Wall Street. Yes. Maybe you could come. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, before and during the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, a uh, question was raised as to the biology of the Negro, whether a Negro is a homo, homo sapien or he's just a simple homo erectus. Another question that came about the Negro is whether or not he can think systematically in a scientific way. Today we label schizophrenia as a Negro disease or a black man disease, sometimes if you research it or so, based on statistics. My question is, with the rise of all these eugenics programs in research that are being founded, does, is any ethnic group here faces challenges like the Negro faced in the past like that? I don't think I really understand that. I, I, I didn't really get what... I, I, whether it are the result of these eugenics but which studies. eugenics? That, what, what, eugenics based but who's on practicing genetic, eugenics? Gen, genetic, genetics research. Genetic research which predetermined the, the line, the human line, the, uh, of who is human and who is not human. Does any, is any ethnic group faces any challenges or questions like what the Negro faced in the past due to these uh, scientific research? I don't think so. I mean, no, I, I think I, I, there's, there's absolutely no credible uh, genetic research which suggests that um, racial distinctions among ostensible human beings uh, put them into a separate species. And as regards disease, whether it's schizophrenia or, or sickle cell disease, um, there's no sort of categorization of uh, a specific sort of racial sort of identification with those. It's purely based on the genetic principles of whether you carry a particular disease allele or have suffered a mutation which has caused it. But the, the um, racial politics has been completely, appropriately, and finally, uh, completely deleted from credible scientific investigation. So that's something we can, uh, we can sort of lament what may have gone before, but we can take some consolation in the fact that that's, you know, we as, have as, that that, that, that's right. I mean, that the, um, the the human species is extremely uniform, uh, and the and separation into into different races is is a very very minor separation. We're very very close. Next question. Um, good evening. Um, uh, touching back to uh, oh, there's been a a string a recent string of conversations in my own life where there's been an underlying question. And in looking around for uh, different opinions, I've looked in, uh, you know, Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris's work, and even your own work uh, in the God Delusion. Uh, the question, my question is, um, 
Can any good or great good come from religion? Good as in beneficial to humanity, enough to keep it in our society, or should we do away with it? I don't think any good can come of it, but I don't think we should do away with it in a sort of dictatorial sense. I would like to think that it would simply wither away, uh, but I fear that may take rather a long time. Um, what do you mean by, um, in the first sense of good, that no good can come of it? I, I simply can't think of any, of any good that comes of it. As in... As in oh, oh, I, I'm told by our uh, stage manager that we only have time for one more question. Uh, two more questions. I don't want, I don't want. <laughs> two more questions. Okay. Make them brief, please. Please. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, uh, Mr. Richard Dawkins. I'm a big fan. Um, I've always pondered the question about uh, intelligence and, um, well, the singularity of intelligence. And I wanted to ask you in particular, about um, is there any room in evolution for a pinnacle of intelligence or a singularity of intelligence in a species or the human race? What was the word before singularity? Uh, pinnacle. Pinnacle. Climax. I don't know what the, the, a word like that would, would mean. I can kind of see what a singularity might mean. It might mean a, a sudden abrupt change, a sudden change if, that If you was... want the word, I, I could like change it to perfection, per se. Yeah, well, I mean, I'd, okay. Um, let, let's stick with, with singularity, which, which, would, which would sort of mean a sudden, abrupt change. Yes. Uh, I don't know that. I mean, I, I think it's arguable that the, uh, the origin of language was a singularity. Um, it, we don't, nobody knows how language evolved. Nobody knows whether it, uh, it happened gradually like virtually all other major evolutionary changes, or whether there was a, a, a major... Um, singularity, a sudden, a sudden change. Um, so th that would probably be the, the best uh, guess I could think of, would be the, would be the origin of language. I, I think you. the idea of, of, of a pinnacle or a perfection would be difficult because there's so many different forms of intelligence yeah, also. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. The last question, I'm, I'm right. sorry, uh, we can't take any more just because of the, uh, the time constraints. Okay. Hi, Dr. Dawkins. I'm a student and uh, um, I have a question about role of religion in establishing communities because I grew up in Miami Beach and there are about half a million Jews here and uh, I, I noticed something that they all seem to be very well connected to each other even though the friends I have they're secular but do you think that religion has a role in establishing communities or are there better ways to establish community because they seem to be the people around me are very well connected with each other and I kind of wish there was a way for me. Yes, I think that's right. And, and that, I mean, what, what's good about it is, of course, the idea of, co of community and fellowship and friendship. And that's what we should be uh, working to, towards. You certainly don't need religion to do that. Uh, you, can, you can set up community and fellowship. Uh, and um, th th that, that's what we ought to be, to be doing, rather than tying it to supernatural superstition. And that concludes our first day of live coverage from the Miami Book Fair. We're back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern for more author talks and your calls with the likes of Randall Kennedy and David Rothkoff. Today's entire schedule will re-air tonight at midnight Eastern.